Today, we like to believe that in all essentials, men and women are similar, equally gifted intellectually and equally capable of all work, except the most physically strenuous. Early in the 20th century, by contrast, nearly all articulate Britons and Americans were more struck by the differences between men and women. Suffrage advocates in both countries argued that women's moral superiority and their natural affinity for charity, compromise and nurture would improve the quality of politics if they were allowed to participate. Opponents of women's suffrage retorted that on the contrary, women's intervention in politics would do nothing to improve politics, but would destroy women's special virtues and qualities, making them mannish, bossy and vulgar. Respectable medical opinion on both sides of the Atlantic agreed that women were oriented around their reproductive systems and prone to hysteria if overstimulated. Helen Kendrick Johnson, one of the most articulate American opponents of women's suffrage, regarded it as an attack on marriage, on, on childbearing and on the family as central institutions of society. And she foresaw that it would introduce strife into the heart of family life. One male reviewer of her book noted that she, quote, possesses a wonderfully unfeminine capability for indulging in calm, logical discussion. In Britain, meanwhile, conservative opponents of women's suffrage pointed to the fact that radical suffragettes, like Christabel Pankhurst, seem to be on the brink of insanity with their window-smashing campaigns and hunger strikes. In the event, women's work and service during World War I strengthened the case for their enfranchisement. Once women had the vote, conservative politicians in both countries scrambled to recruit them and found the reality of their participation far less odious than their anticipation of it. The first woman to sit in the British Parliament, Nancy Astor, was herself an American by birth and a conservative. Well, ideas about the essential difference between men and women could be used to justify the pro-suffrage position and the anti-suffrage position. Middle-class Victorians on both sides of the Atlantic, men and women, developed a theory of separate spheres. The idea was that women's role in life was to nurture children and to form their consciences and to instill religious and moral values. And women, particularly middle-class women, were described in a language that simultaneously exalted and confined them. Uh, characteristic language described them as the angels of the household, saying that they were made for nurture and that they were organised around reproduction. But that, on the other hand, uh, the, uh, the assertion was women are less capable of sustained education, less able to undertake uh, sustained mental effort and vulnerable to hysteria. Here's a little bit of characteristic rhetoric. This is from the, uh, the Catholic Cardinal of Baltimore, Cardinal Gibbons, in the 1870s. And he says, Woman is queen indeed, but her empire is the domestic kingdom. The greatest political triumphs she would achieve in public life fade into insignificance compared with the serene glory which radiates from the domestic shrine and which she illumines and warms by her conjugal and motherly virtues. Now you can see in this remark the typical conservative view that the family is the basic institution of society, not the individual, and that a society is healthy in proportion as its families are intact, with mother at the very centre. Now, admittedly, Cardinal uh, Gibbons was uh, an American Catholic, but this wasn't a point of view that was confined to the Catholics, and neither is it a view which was confined to the men. Let me give you a parallel quotation from Catherine Beecher. She was, the daughter, she was the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, one of the most famous American novels of the, of the 19th century. And uh, Catherine Beecher wrote lots of advice books to young women. And she also believed uh, that women's special place was in the home and that the, the, the sacred role of, of women given to them by God himself was to nurture the new generations of men. Catherine Beecher writes, Though she may not teach from the portico, nor thunder from the forum, in her secret retirement she may form and send forth the sages that shall govern and renovate the world. Though she may not gird herself for bloody conflict, nor sound the trumpet of war, she may enwrap herself in the panoply of heaven, 
and send the thrill of benevolence through a thousand youthful hearts. The claim here, of course, is that what the women are really doing a more important job than the men because it's in the home that they're, they're creating the character of each new generation. But in practice, women lacked legal rights. Their property became their husbands at the time of marriage. They weren't allowed to take independent legal action. In the very, very unlikely case of a divorce or a separation, women were likely to lose in custody battles. Women could be com committed for insanity on the, on the uh, specifications of the husbands who could, who could call in a doctor and have their wives committed. They couldn't serve on juries. And all these kinds of disadvantages were conditions against which the early suffrage advocates protested. But it's important to emphasize, I think, because it's easy for us to forget this, that advocates of votes for women didn't say that women were really much more similar to men. They also agreed with this conception that women and men are totally different and that it's because of the differences that women ought to be allowed to vote. People like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony said, women's superior moral qualities would elevate the tone of politics from its degraded condition in the late 19th century. I described in some previous lectures the, uh, the degradation of urban politics against which people like Theodore Roosevelt felt so strongly and the mugwumps. And uh, upper and middle class women in both countries were saying, we can elevate the, the standard of politics. The emphasis in the works of Stanton and Antony in America and of Millicent Fawcett, their counterpart in England, was on difference. They didn't say give us the vote because we're just like men. They said give us the vote because we're different from and better than men. Well, anti-suffragists used the same idea but with a slightly different spin. In their view, to enter a world of argument and force and coarseness, the arena of public political debate, would be to brutalize women and to rob them of the special qualities which added such a, a luster to civilization. Anti-suffragists said it would be awful if women had to serve on juries. It means that they'd have to spend their time mingling with criminals and that they'd have to hand their children over to nannies and paid servants. If politics was coarse and corrupt, that must mean that as mothers, women had been falling short in their role as nurturers. For them to get into politics would further weaken their proper role. In other words, if politics is already deficient, it's because the mothers haven't really been raising the, the children well enough. So the, the job is for the women to retreat further into the home. Now, a frequently quoted idea, uh, on, again, on both sides of the Atlantic, was that men are naturally barbarians but the women have the role of taming and domesticating them. In the lecture on Theodore Roosevelt, I mentioned Elihu Root, uh, and we saw him in a previous lecture uh, opposing the direct election of senators. He was equally opposed to the idea that women should be given the vote. In this also, he was dismayed by the constitutional amendment which eventually was passed. And Root said, Suffrage, if it means anything, means entering upon the field of political life and politics is modified war. In politics there is strife, contention, bitterness, heartburning, excitement, agitation. Everything which is adverse to the true nature of women. Woman rules today by the sweet and noble influences of her character. Put woman into the arena of conflict and she abandons these great weapons which control the world. And she takes into her hands, feeble and nerveless for strife, weapons with which she is unfamiliar and which she is unable to wield. Woman in strife becomes hard, harsh, unlovable, repulsive. Many conservative women in both countries echoed this idea that politics is war by other means and that therefore it's anathema to women. While well, anti-suffragists saw their worst fears confirmed in the conduct of the radical Women's Social and Political Union in Britain. This was the astonishing organization uh, in Britain led by Emmeline Pankhurst, the wife of a North Country manufacturer, and her two daughters, Christabel and Sylvia. It was founded in 1903, uh, and the women of this family were impatient at the lack of progress which was being made towards the enfranchisement of women. The very first parliamentary bill for women's votes had been introduced into Parliament in 1867 
and sponsored by John Stuart Mill. But although 1867 was the year of the Second Reform Act, it didn't include the principle of votes for women, and neither did the, the Third Reform Act of 1884. At the same time, incidentally, back in the 1860s, it had been a source of special disappointment to the American suffragists, people like uh, Antony and Stanton, that although the recently freed slaves had been given the vote, even though many of them were illiterate, highly educated women such as themselves were still being denied. Well now, the, the, the Pankhursts, after 1903, specialised in escalating tactics on behalf of women's votes. They said, we've got to take direct action, and we've got to be as conspicuous as possible in doing it. They certainly overcame the long tradition that women ought not to make themselves conspicuous in public life. First, they chained themselves to the railings in Downing Street outside the Prime Minister's house, making it very difficult for them to be taken away. Then one of them chained herself to a statue in the House of Commons lobby. Next, they and their supporters began smashing department store windows in Oxford Street and Regent Street, assaulting policemen. When they were taken to jail, they went on hunger strikes, dropping explosives into mailboxes, in every way trying to disrupt everyday life. And this is in Edwardian Britain, where women... Uh, seemingly decorous and well-dressed and demure, suddenly would take hammers and smash the windows or little explosives out of their bags. Sylvia Pankhurst describes more of their methods. She says, Destructive militancy on a hitherto unparalleled scale. Petty injuries and annoyances continuing side by side with large-scale damage. Street lamps were broken. Chairs flung into the serpentine. This is the... Um, the lake in St. James's Park next to Buckingham Palace. Cushions of railway carriages slashed, flower beds damaged, golf, green, golf greens all over the country scraped and burned with acid. Empty houses and other unattended buildings were systematically sought out and set on fire. Bombs were placed near the Bank of England. Lloyd George's new house, in process of construction at Walton on the Hill, was injured beyond repair by a bomb explosion. An incredible succession of actions taken by the suffragettes. The most dramatic action of all came in the year 1913. Every year the most famous horse race in England is the Derby. It's the counterpart to the Kentucky Derby here in the United States. And a young suffragette called Emily Davidson at the Derby ran under the rails and threw herself under the horse which was uh, owned by the king and was racing in the Derby. She was killed. And... To the suffragettes, she became a martyr to the cause. Well, it was absolutely horrifying to conservative women to see well-dressed ladies acting in ways like this. It was also very annoying to moderate suffragists in the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, led by Millicent Fawcett. In reform movements, this is often the case, that you have a moderate organisation which is tending to emphasise its reasonableness and on the other hand, a militant wing, which commits outrages that draw a lot of attention, but tends to make the cause itself suffer and seem like the work of cranks. Radicalism gave credibility to the Women's National Anti-Suffrage League, that is the organisation of women, which gathered to oppose the idea of votes for women. Its journal, The Review, was full of horrified reactions to the radicals. Readers on both sides of the Atlantic kept in touch with what was going on in the other country. And certainly American pro- and anti-suffrage women knew about the Pankhursts and knew about Emily Davidson. Some of them were convinced that Christian civilization itself was at stake and it might very well be jeopardized if women entered political life. Again, in the course, I've several times mentioned people who predict the fall of Western civilization. It's a, it's a recurrent conservative fear and certainly came, it arose to an acute, uh, to a crescendo in the debate over women's votes. Listen to an American writer called Joseph Pyle writing in 1913, the same year as the death of Emily Davidson. He writes, With Christianity, there came into the world a new example and a new thought. To woman's whole nature appealed that life of self-sacrifice, of love and of willing service that has created a new heaven and a new earth. From the foot of the cross there arose and went out into the world a womanhood 
They did not demand or claim or threaten or arrogate. Woman has become to man not only a companion, but an inspiration. Out of the crucible of the centuries has come what we not only love, but adore, before which, in certain hours, we bow with a reverence that links us unconsciously with the divine. It is Christian civilization that is in the balance. Well, as you've probably noticed from these, these eulogies, these encomiums to the beauty and, and, uh, and divine quality of women, this is a debate which is going on mainly in the upper and, and uh, upper middle classes among women who don't have to work. It was already the case that hundreds of thousands of women in both countries were working in factories and on farms and as domestic servants, but they're, they're not the kind of women who are being idealised in, in, in the superheated rhetoric of this kind. Now, interestingly, there were women who were involved in political life who said it was an advantage to them to lack the vote. So long as women lacked the vote, they could influence all citizens without the suspicion that they were interested parties. A very interesting argument was made by Emily Bissell. This was an American woman active in the politics of the state of Delaware. She played a significant role in drafting and working and gathering information to support child labor laws. She was a consumer advocate and she was an activist in the Red Cross. And she insisted that it was better, better for this political work that women didn't have the vote. She said, the voteless woman can go to any man, Republican or Democrat, she can ask for laws that create offices without the suspicion that she wants to hold them. She cannot trade or deal. She is known to be disinterested, and it doesn't have to be proved. A woman working for any measure in a legislature has an immense advantage over a man. And that's an interesting point of view, isn't it? One that it would be hard to reconstruct if we didn't know about it. That someone who was politically active herself didn't want to have the vote and didn't want the, didn't want the right to be able to hold such offices. Well, opposition to the suffrage was in effect the natural conservative position. The great difficulty for the suffragists was always to get themselves taken seriously at all, because it would have meant such a big change in the way politics had always been done. The British historian Brian Harrison, who studied it very closely in the British context, says, Opposition to a reforming movement often springs less from distaste for the cause itself than from a temperamental dislike of reforms in general. Anti-suffragism was particularly prevalent among, among those who were conservative by temperament, especially in matters of day-to-day -day social life. The suffragists, mainly women of the higher classes, found it very difficult indeed to enlist working class supporters. There's an enormous fatalism among working class people in Britain, which was much stronger then than it is today. This idea that things are the way they are because they've simply been destined in that way, and that the ordinary person's just not got to make a fuss about it. Working class people had always been very reluctant indeed to join visionary crusades. And it's important to remember that the Labour Party, the great rising force in British politics in the early part of the 20th century, was itself very socially conservative. Working class hecklers sometimes broke up votes for women demonstrations by brandishing signs that read blokes for women. In other words, make, making what we'd call a sexist joke, imputing sexual frustration to suffragists' actions. Here's the historian Harrison again. He writes, the working man had all the more reason to resist feminist ideas because he normally had no domestic servants to protect him from its full implications for his domestic routine. Perhaps in compensation for their subordination elsewhere, working men were often authoritarian in the home. So the suffrage movement suffered from not being able to recruit uh, ready uh, uh, supporters from the working class. Now, the Labour Party and the trade unions which had given birth to the Labour Party themselves tended to be hostile to feminism because they were afraid that with a, great change in, a potential great change in gender relations, women might enter the workforce in much larger numbers. And of course, the more, if more women were coming into the workforce, that would tend to create a downward pressure on wages if women were admitted and the unions were struggling to prevent wages from being uh, uh, decreased and trying to work to get them increased. So the labour movement and the unions and the Labour Party have all got a built-in incentive not to be enthusiastic about women's suffrage or what we'd call feminist rights.
Higher up the social scale, many Conservatives were sceptical of democracy in the first place, as we've seen throughout the course, especially in Britain. And they viewed the extension of the vote to women, most of whom would not be well educated, as worsening an already severe problem. But some elite women did make the argument that their education gave them a better entitlement to vote than ignorant working men. Here's Lady Louisa Knightley speaking in 1885. She said she was waiting outside the polling station on election day while her husband voted. Quote, and felt for the first time personally the utter anomaly of my not having the vote while Joe Bull has. Joe Bull's an imaginary, uh, the, it's a, a reference to the ordinary working man. She suddenly starts to realise how strange it is that I, despite all my uh, education, and being excluded, while men who in fact can't read and write are given the right to vote. She was the founder of the Conservative and Unionist Women's Franchise Association in 1908. This was a group of pro-suffrage conservative women, and its members sometimes joined in the big suffrage demonstrations. Here's her description from the year 1910 of a suffrage march, and she adds in what I think of as a very ladylike tone of voice, Our banners made a brilliant display and many of our branches were well represented. Warwickshire, Hull and Croydon branches all contributed beautiful banners. All our members wore the colours of the association, carrying pennants and bouquets of flowers. In other words, they've got the accoutrements of their ladylikeness, and these are conservative ladies. They're trying to de-radicalise the suffrage movement by showing that distinguished ladies such as themselves can join in. Here's another example of a, of a pro-suffrage conservative, the Baroness Henry de Worms, writing in 1887. She wrote, This is not an age when men must work and women must weep. Women need not neglect their homes because they share the aims and aspirations of their husbands or fathers or brothers. The more women interest themselves in subjects of universal importance, the happier are their homes likely to become. So counteracting arguments like Elihu Root who says women are going to become brutalised by politics, she says no, home life will be stronger if man and woman together can take a common interest in political life. Well the debate over suffrage was affected by other political and intellectual trends of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, especially by the rise of socialism. Many conservatives saw a continuum between socialism, free love and women's participation in politics. They had the idea that all these things were dangerous and that they went together. They certainly believed that socialism was somehow synonymous with the destruction of marriage in favour of a kind of erotic selfishness and self-indulgence. And uh, the, the, the term used at the time was free love. Caroline Corbyn of Connecticut, writing in 1888, argued that socialism meant degrading women to the promiscuous level of men. In other words, rather than raising everyone up, it would be pushing the women down. But at the, very, at the far end of the political spectrum, the threat of German military power appeared in the debate, strange as it may seem. For example, Lord Cromer who was another of the great British imperial proconsuls, a man very much in the same stripe as Lord Milner or Lord Curzon, whom I've mentioned in connection with the empire, said this in a speech of 1910. The German man is manly, and the German woman is womanly. Can we hope to compete with such a nation as this if we war against nature and endeavour to invert the natural roles of the sexes? We cannot do so. In other words, women ought not to get to the vote because were they to get it, we'd be less likely to be able to defeat Germany in a war. It sounds like a very, very strange line of argumentation, but clearly was convincing to Cromer. The debate also was sometimes cast in the language of evolution. I've mentioned at various points in the course how, after the publication of Darwin's book on the origin of species back in 1859, other groups had picked up evolutionary language and applied it to areas of economics and politics as well. And it was applied, not surprisingly, to the suffrage vote, to the suffrage debate as well. Evolution shows us how organism, organisms adapt to special niches. And so the differentiation of spheres between men and women could be seen as this kind of specialization. If so, then reducing the difference by enfranchising women was going to be evolutionarily retrogressive. An American writer called Mrs. A.J. George, writing in 1916, said, 
the vote would be a backward step toward conditions where the work of man and woman were the same because neither sex had evolved enough to see the wisdom of being specialists in their own line. All right, so the idea here is the more we evolve, the more different men and women are going to become. In a, a previous lecture, we also, so, so, uh, we also encountered the idea of Anglo-Saxon race suicide. This was the kind of thing that people like Madison Grant were very preoccupied by. The idea was this, if women go into politics instead of being mothers, then the Anglo-Saxon birth rate is going to fall further and the Anglo-Saxons are going to be swamped by the less advantaged races. Neglected sons will become weak and so America would become, quote, a race of masculine women and effeminate men. And the mating of these would result in the, in the procreation of a race of degenerates. Well, in the event, the decisive um, change in the situation came from the First World War. When millions of men were drafted into the military services, women's services in both economies uh, became indispensable. Women went to do all sorts of jobs, particularly in industry, which they'd never done previously. It greatly strengthened the suffrage position to show, look at the way in which women are capable of doing all these jobs which previously were confined to the men. And that, in turn, led to constitutional changes in both nations. A constitutional amendment passed through Congress and then through three quarters of the states in, the in 1920, in time for women to participate in the 1920 presidential election. And the president they chose was Warren G. Harding, a much, much more conservative man than his immediate predecessor, Woodrow Wilson. In 1918, Parliament in Britain passed a vote uh, which specified that women over the age of 30 could vote if they were the owners of five pounds worth of real estate. So it was, uh, women's suffrage was more restricted at first, but it, it was then extended to full equality by a second act of Parliament in 1928, just 10 years later. It was bitterly disappointing to feminists because they discovered that most women voted in the same way as their fathers if they weren't married and the same way as their husbands if they were married. In other words, there wasn't the same kind of transformation of political life as some feminist leaders had anticipated. Meanwhile, former opponents of women's suffrage were quick to note that women tended, if anything, to be politically more conservative than men. The first woman to sit in Parliament was Nancy Astor, born in America. She'd never been a suffragist, but she'd become popular because of her charity work with wounded British soldiers during the First World War. She was the wife of an aristocrat. And when, when her husband's father died and he inherited the noble title, it meant that he had to go to the seat in the House of Lords. And so she, did, she decided to uh, stand for Parliament to get his seat. And she won it in 1919. She was a very good speaker and great at dealing with hecklers. In the 1920s and 1930s, she had a long feud with Winston Churchill, partly because she was uh, an advocate of appeasement of Hitler in the 1930s. There's a famous anecdote about one of their exchanges in which Nancy Astor says, Winston, if you were my husband, I'd put poison in your coffee. To which Churchill answered, Nancy, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. Another distinguished member of parliament was the Duchess of Athol, who'd been a leading anti-suffragist. She opposed votes for women, but once women got the vote and got the right to sit in Parliament, she became a Conservative Member of Parliament from 1923 to 1938. Eventually, she resigned in protest over the Conservative government's appeasement of Hitler in the late 1930s. She was a supporter of the Spanish Republic and an outspoken anti-communist, much closer to the positions espoused by Winston Churchill. Well, the history of the anti-suffragists has been all, all but forgotten. The price of defeat in political disputes is often oblivion. I think it's, it's worth hanging on to this thought. Before women got the vote, the people who were arguing for it were vulnerable to ridicule. Once they had the vote, those who'd argued against it in turn were ridiculed, and then they were forgotten. <laughs>